Hey there, Dad, welcome back. So let's see where we're at. Um, here's what we've learned so far. We've learned that muscles move things, move things like bones and food and air and urine and all sorts of things. And then we kind of narrowed it down and said skeletal muscles, what they do is they work in pairs to move bones back and forth because one characteristic of muscle tissue is that the it can only pull or become shorter and then relax. And then when we took it from there, we did a whole little project about um, muscle fatigue and learning about that skeletal muscle is quite strong, but it does tire out quite easily as you all experienced. And so what we're really trying to pull this all together into is that when we looked at endurance, we found that there were different variables that sort of affected the endurance of some of us. And and so let's move it forward one step and let's look a little bit closer at how our muscles actually move our bones, okay? And so what we're gonna look at today in a sense is how our skeleton and our musculoskeleton are like a bunch of machines that are put together to make movement in different directions. And so here's a couple little facts that you're gonna find helpful along the way. The movement of our skeleton happens at joints, and this is where the bones are tied together with ligaments. Things like our shoulders and our hips, shoulders and our hips, are both joints that join our arms and our legs to our bodies. And these kinds of joints actually move in any direction you want to. Your shoulders can go up, down, and in circles. The same thing with your legs up, down, and in circles, all right? And then we also have things like knees and elbows, which take those limbs and fold them in half and then extend them again. And so what we're looking at here is a skeleton that is made of bones that are specially shaped to form each joint for the proper motion they're designed to make. Okay, and so just how do our muscles pull on our bones? Well, the, the big concept today is the idea of the lever. We're using movement on the basis of a principle called the lever. So with that, we'll send it over to Dr. Silas. Move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it. I like well, hello there, Dodd Middle School bitch. You're wondering what I'm doing right now, but I do have a method to my madness, and I'm gonna share that with you right now. So what I have here on my head is a lever. And what does the lever have to do with the musculoskeletal system? Well, that's what today's all about. So you just be a little bit patient. By the time we're done, you're gonna learn something new today. So, so let's get started, all right? Do you remember back in the old days that you may or may not have learned something about simple machines? Maybe it was the inclined plane, maybe it was the pulley, or maybe, just maybe, it was something called the lever. And so if you ever learned about it, I bet you forgot some parts, but if you never learned about it, let's get started. So what you're going to need to do this, and you might have to pause after I get through this list, but you're going to need a few things to do this along with me. First, you might want a paper and pencil because you might have to make a sketch of something that you make, okay? All right then, so next here's what you're going to need. You're going to need something that you're going to call the lever itself. The lever is kind of like the rod or the plank that is stretched across a distance, all right? And so you could use, I would suggest maybe a ruler if you have one. I brought along a back scratcher. You really can't find much a butter knife can do, but I bet you even a paint stick would work for that. All right, so that's one thing you're gonna need, any one of those kind of things. Also, you're gonna need something that's going to be the weight that we're trying to move. And so that's called the load. And so it's also sometimes called the resistance. Doesn't matter what you're gonna use. You can use a quarter, you can use a little jewelry box, you can use a clip, you can use food coloring, you can use a little thing that you use when you do your toenails. Doesn't matter, all right? But you need something to use for the load. 
All right. What else you're going to need? Well, you're going to need something that's called the pivot or the fulcrum. It's the part of the lever that kind of supports it and just kind of stays in place while the lever moves around it. And so you can use pretty much anything. I'm just trying to keep away from a flat surface at the top so it can rock evenly. And so here's a bigger one so I can get more movement. But you can use even a marker or a cork or something like that that allows you to be able to rock your lever back and forth across the fulcrum. All right. So we'll take a few minutes to play with all these little parts and put them together and make different kind of levers. All right. So why don't you go get that and be right back. Hey y'all, y'all back now? Did you get all the things you need? I hope so. Cause let's, let's play with these parts a little bit and see what we can make. So the very first kind of lever we're gonna make is called a first class lever, okay? And let me show you kind of how it's set up. Kind of like I have it set up here. What you need is you need to have the pivot or the fulcrum in the middle, the weight on one side, and then the push on the other. So that's what we got here. I got the pivot, the fulcrum right in the middle. I got the lever going all the way across it. I got my weight or my load on one side, and then I am going to be myself the effort that pushes on the other side. And so the beauty of a first class lever is the kind of movement that it makes is when you push in one direction, the lever moves in the other direction. All right, so let's see that. Are you doing it too? I hope so. So I push on this side downward, and the effect is that the load is being pulled upward. So you probably had some experience with this in your life. I bet you played a little old game called Seesaw. That's the idea. You guys in Seesaw take turns between being the load and the effort. All right. You might also have perhaps ever tried to pry something out of the ground, all right, using a pry bar or a shovel. That's the same concept too. Just accept that it's a little bit more like this. Where you're trying to get that rock out of the ground, here's the end of your shovel and you push on the handle to pop it out. Make sense? All right. And then another one you guys might be more aware of which I probably need to stand this up a little bit for, is this, kind of like in a rowboat. So when you're on a rowboat, what you're doing is you pull the rowboat or you pull the oar in one direction and that moves the paddle in the other direction. And so these are all tools that we use that are called first class levers. So what they have going on in their structure of a first class lever is we will have the pivot point between the load and the effort. And so that when we press on one side, it makes the other side go in the opposite direction. Make sense? Hope so. All right, so let's clean that one up. And while we do that, would you guys please just make a little sketch? A little sketch that looks just like this. Type one or class one, either way, where we have the lever going across with the pivot point shown as a triangle there. That's this, all right? On one end, I have the load right here, and on the other end, I have the effort, which is me over here. So make that little sketch of where the parts of the lever are spread out to make the movement. Good job. The first kind of lever was kind of fun. Let's make another kind of lever. This kind of lever is called a class two lever. All right, there it is. All right, so this one, what we have going on here is we have the pivot point at one end. We actually have the load that we're lifting in the middle and then the effort goes on the other end. That seems like a strange lever. However, let's look at a few examples of things you know that are already second class levers, all right? And so right here, if you ever heard of a wheelbarrow where you kind of lift one end and you got the, the rocks in the middle and the barrel in the other, that's a second class lever. Nutcracker, if you ever had the kind where it's kind of, you have to put the the nut in the middle and you squeeze the two parts together. 
All right, well, that's the second class lever as well. And I got another one hanging around here too. All right, the nail clipper. Way over here is the pivot point, because what I got to do is I got to bring this bar down onto there so I can clip the nail. But the push comes from the middle. See where that comes from? And so that's a second class lever as well. All right, and so let's take a look at what kind of movement we make with that. So the idea of a second class lever, we're not changing the direction of the movement. We're just making it a little bit easier to lift. And so if you can see, this is sort of our wheelbarrow right here, where if this was the wheel and this was the handle, this is the load in the middle. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna be the effort again and lift. And so therefore, this becomes a lighter load for me to lift because it's in the middle. I don't have to bear all the weight all by myself. Make sense? All right. And so that's a second class lever. So what should you sketch? Let me find the right card here. There she is. All right. This is a class two or a type two lever. All right, a class two or a type two lever, what it has is the pivot point on one end the effort or the pull on the other end, and the weight or the load in the middle. So make that little sketch, because you're going to need a little bit later. All right. Good. All right. So we're going to move on to the third class lever. So hang on, let me get that set up for you. All right. So here we are setting ourselves up for a third class lever. A third class lever is a very interesting kind of one. So let's get some good examples of some third class levers that you might know in everyday life. Kind of like a fishing rod where you plant the, the handle in that little pouch there. And I don't know much about fishing myself, all right? But then you pull from right above there and you pull it back and you pull it back. And that resistance is on the other end of the line and you're trying to reel it in. And you're, you're pulling from between the fulcrum and the force. Hope that makes sense. Another more simple one than some of you might have done is the idea of the broom, all right? You sort of hold the handle there and then you sweep it on through. And so the idea of the third class lever there still has the effort between the fulcrum and the load at the bottom. Another more common one that some of you might have ever thought of, especially if you're into some old time kind of stories, is the idea of the drawbridge that's over the remote, all right? And so as that bridge is down, and here's the wall right here, there's usually some kind of apparatus, some kind of chain that is ratcheting that drawbridge up and pulling it so that it's all the way up. So whether this lever is a fishing rod where I'm going to pull that fish in right from here or whether it's a broom that I'm going to sweep by pulling through here or whether it's a drawbridge I'm going to lift by pulling from here. It's all examples of how we're using a lever that has a fulcrum at one end, the load at the other, but the pull or the effort from the middle. All right, there's one thing we haven't done yet is figure out what does this have to do with the musculoskeletal system. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to start all over again with that type or class one lever. So let's see where in our bodies we might have such a joint. All right, and so here's the example here. If you haven't figured it out already, what I have on our lever here is the pivot point being our neck. I got the effort being the muscles in the front and the back of our neck. And I got the load being the head itself. So in other words, on you, if you're thinking about your head hanging down, you got to shorten the muscles on the back of your head to pull them back up. And then when your head is back, you need to shorten the muscles in the front of your neck to pull your head back down, just like a seesaw. So your head is just like a seesaw using a first class lever. So add that to your sketch that you nodding your head up and down is an example of a first class lever. All right, you guys, let's give this second class lever a try. I like this second class lever. It's a kind of cool one. What this one is really showing is your foot. 
because your foot is the lever itself going across, all right? And the load that's on that foot is you. Your entire body weight is resting on your feet. So if we have at one end, we have the pivot point, which is your toes or the ball of your foot. At the other end, we have the heel, which is where we're going to pull from. Who's going to do that pulling, you ask? Oh, well, the one who's going to be doing that pulling is your calf muscle. Your calf muscle will pull on your heel so that you can do a tippy toe, thereby lifting the weight of your body fully off of your heel and putting it onto the ball of your foot. That, my dear, is a second-class lever. All right, y'all, let's try to bring this home with a third-class lever. All right, the third-class lever is another interesting one because this is where you guys are going to be like a drawbridge, where you're going to be lifting something that's kind of long and heavy but pulling it from the middle. And so let's take a look at the parts of the lever here in this one, all right? And so the pivot point here is going to be your elbow because this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be lifting our forearm and bringing it up towards our shoulder. There, all right and so the pivot point is right here okay the lever itself for the bones of my arm and the load is what's ever in my hand or just the weight of my forearm to begin with all right and so what is going to lift this arm well what's going to lift this arm is the muscles of my bicep and the muscles that are called my biceps right in the front of my upper arm here are attached at one end up in my upper arm into my shoulder and at the bottom end they're inserted right here in front of my elbow kind of like right here all right and you can feel those tendons right here when you flex your biceps you can feel them pulling and feel them and you can follow them all the way into your forearm and so here's the concept of how this works all right and so if this is your elbow and this is your hand and this is what you're holding in your hand then the biceps come down and what they do is they lift and pull whatever's in your hand upwards towards your shoulder. And so that's the idea of the third class lever. Can you see the moat in here too? It's the idea if this was the castle and this was the drawbridge, there's probably some chain that they crank to pull that drawbridge up towards the wall. It's the same idea of fishing. All right, if this is the handle of the fishing rod and this is the fish you're pulling in, this usually stays still and then you pull from the middle and you pull. And so it's the same thing with our elbow because if this is our upper arm and this is our lower arm, we're going to use this bicep like it's a drawbridge chain and hook it right into the top of our forearm so that when my bicep just gets a little bit shorter, it brings up my hand a whole lot. And so same thing here. I don't have to move my bicep that far, just that far, to get all that motion out of my hand. All right, and so that's the concept of the third class lever. And so I hope you understand that all the movement of the joints in your body are based on some kind of lever, whether it's first class, second class, or third class. Because what we need to do in order to move is use a muscle to pull on a bone to make it move so that we can have motion. So y'all, while I have you, I just wanted to let you know that this is going to be our last lesson here together on the human body, all right? My job is done, and now what it is time for me to do, no matter where I come from, whether I'm coming from somewhere across the pond or y'all coming here somewhere from down the south, either way, I want you to know that I've enjoyed my time with you and it's been a great pleasure for me to teach you a few little lessons along the way. But I want to let you know that Mrs. Seymour's got you in good hands for the next unit. The next unit's a very interesting one as well and it's about heredity and genetics and you're going to have a special guest coming for that unit as well. So I'm going to sign off and wish you a happy, healthy time and see you soon everybody, I hope. Bye-bye.
Oh, thanks again, Dr. Silas. That was perfect. Um, and I also want to thank you, Dr. Silas, for all the help that you've given us here on The Human Body. I know this is the last big lesson that you'll be doing with us, and so we won't be seeing you again here for the rest of the school year. So I want to thank you, Dr. Silas, for being such a great resource for so many of the lessons that we've learned here when we are in the human body. So back to us, Dodd. So before you continue your lesson, Make sure that from the video, you have sketched out each of the types of levers. And also make sure you've written next to it also an example of how one part of your body moves using each of those types of levers, okay? And so let's review those really quick. Your neck and your head was like a first class lever, kind of like the seesaw that rocks back and forth with the pivot in the middle. And then we had the ball of your foot, which was like a second class lever, kind of like the wheelbarrow. The weight of your body sits squarely on your foot, and when you do the tippy toe, the ball of your foot remains stationary, that's the pivot point, while your heel is lifted off the ground, which is where the effort comes from. And then lastly, with the third class lever, we had the elbow, which also works for the knee as well, where what we're doing is we're using our bicep being attached between the pivot point and the load that we're carrying and pulling up our arm as if it were a drawbridge. And so you guys, what you're gonna do is you're gonna follow the next steps in the document. Um, feel free to email us or contact with any questions you have. You know we miss you a whole lot and we hope you're happy and healthy. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.